We'll have Magnus Magnusson. He is also from UNESCO. Um, he took up his duties as Director for Partnerships and Outreach in the Sector for, so for Social and Human Science at UNESCO in 2017. Prior to joining UNESCO, he held positions as Vice President for Emerging Markets and Sustainability at Eco Capacity Exchange. He was the Head of Government Relations Northern Europe at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Head of Business Development and External Relations at the United Nations Capital Development Fund, and Regional Manager at the Nordic Development Fund with responsibility for a 150 million infrastructure portfolio in Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Ghana, and Ethiopia. He started his career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden and had this desk responsibility for the World Bank, Regional Development Banks, IFAD, and microfinance. Thereafter, he joined the Nordic Council of Ministers as senior advisor for the finance, transport, and development cooperation sectors. He also acted as secretary to the Board of Governors of the Nordic Investment Bank, Nordic Development Fund, and was a representative in the Board of Nordic Project Fund. He subsequently joined the United Nations Environment Program um, in Stockholm. Um, Mr. Magnusson has an academic background in social sciences, business administration and economics, and uh, environmental studies from Uppsala, the Swedish Royal Institute of Technology, the Stockholm School of Economics, and the University of California, Berkeley. And he has wrote, written his thesis on microfinance in rural Laos. Um, um, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all, to, to speak. Um, my voice is a little bit like Rod Stewart today, so I hope you excuse me for that. Uh, maybe not a bad thing. Um, I am director of the social and human science sector at UNESCO. Uh, we are one of five sectors um, and we focus on the usage or translation of scientific knowledge into social and human science to policy impact. You could call that the overarching um, objective. We work on youth, we work on sports, we work on ethics of science. Um, bioethics, that's the area where the AI and ethics normative work uh, will start um, after the general conference that goes on right now, if the 193 governments agree on it, which we expect. Um, we also work on social transformation, on futures literacy, which is another version of foresight, so anticipation. And we work on intercultural dialogue, human rights, uh, um, anti-racism and, and those dimensions. So let me start by quoting um, the um, known philosopher Hans Jonas, who in 1973, I believe it was, said, humanity's future will, de will be determined by how we manage scientific uncertainty. Scientific uncertainty. I think for those of us who follow the climate change debate, probably most in the room, we know that he was very right. It's the scientific uncertainty that we have a very hard time to manage because it leaves a little bit of scope for some very powerful groups to um, disagree and, and pursue and lobby against something that the scientists generally agree on. So how do we manage that? And how do we manage our actions, our ethical frameworks, which all generates from how we manage our own minds? Um, this is the privilege we have at UNESCO to speak about what's in between the ears. Our mission is to create the conditions for peace in the minds of men and women. So it's actually a cognitive mission. Now, in order to succeed with that mission, we have to understand how the mind works. We are not doing enough on that. Um, I'm very pleased to join a new working group um, that was set up by Jeffrey Sachs just two weeks ago. Um, uh, hosted by the Vatican, at least the first meeting, with 30 scientists from different fields, uh, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, sociology, animal psychology, organizational psychology, uh, spiritual leaders or, or religious leaders, if you like, and philosophy. Uh, we sat in a room for two days to launch a global collaboration on understanding well-being and happiness from these perspectives. And I'll get back to why that matters for AI. I will speak um, a little bit about our this capacity of working with the future. I will speak about growth and wealth, as you saw from my bio, and I'm sorry, it was very long. Um, I've worked in finance, actually, before, so I'm very pleased to be now back at my core interest, which is social psychology. I will talk about well-being. I will talk about artificial intelligence as a driver of technology and low-cost, high-quality social services. And I will 
frame it all within what I would call co-leapfrogging. So leapfrogging, but co-leapfrogging. And the co, I will get back to what that means, but maybe to give, give you a heads up, it really is about how we're in the same boat as those less fortunate. Those living across the Mediterranean, those that live in low-income countries or even uh, lower uh, middle-income countries. And what their future means for us and the other way around. So it will be a little bit about digital divide as well. Um, the first issue of futures literacy. How good are we actually at predicting the future? We're completely lousy. Most of us live, I'd say 99.9% .9 of us, live in a Kodak moment almost every day. Right? We don't even realize how wrong we are in predicting our future, the future of our society around us. And, and yet we talk about it, right? We're very interested in it. But we fail to learn how our minds work when, it, when we think about the future. So this is why UNESCO and also OECD is working on uh, what generally is called foresight or anticipation systems. At UNESCO, we've taken it into our mission of building peace in the minds of men and women. So we call it futures literacy. And it's actually a learning by doing exercise. We just trained the European Banking Association across the city here about the future of banking wasn't very bright, but it was still fun. Uh, and the idea is really to get every participant, and for example, we trained the Norwegian government uh, last year on the future of Norway in 2040. Uh, we are training the climate uh, UN colleagues and the EU as well, the EU commission. Um, and the way it works basically is that we give exercises to the trainees to first talk about the um, expected future that they see. Each individual, what's the expected future? And then we have some indicators or some dimensions we ask the group to talk about. And then we talk about the desired future, you know, what we'd like to see. And that actually helps each individual to understand their bias about the future and how long you can see. You're basically your zone of influence on yourself, if you like. Then we go into a crazy mode of possible futures, where people, now knowing their biases, step out of their comfort zone, uh, as Kodak never did, and, and actually explore what actually could happen. Right? That in, in a way, you can compare it to a, to a, to, to a deep data analysis of, a, of an AI, where most of us would look for the correlation over here in the data set, and the AI finds it over there. Right? That's only useful, though, if it's for the good, right? If it's for the bad, in whatever dimension, it, we don't really want it, do we, right? So, um, but it is that capacity. And I think when you're human, I think it's actually a good capacity to be able to imagining the future beyond, right? What we usually do is try to put people into a knowledge society mode, right? So not a mass production, not a agricultural society, but a knowledge society where what you know and what you want and need matters more than anything else. Right? So not copying what society wants from you, but what you actually need and want. Right? So we, we, it, it becomes a very cognitive first person exercise where we put people in a situation where they actually have to look at, what am I driven by? Do I have control of what I want? Do I know what I want? Do I have control of my emotions? Can I deal with them as they come and therefore be more powerful and not being influenced by fake news, by my father saying something he said for years that gets me irritated? Can I change the situation? This is what we talk about with the Jeffrey Sachs group, among other things, the skills of well-being. So I'll get back to that again. So let me talk about a little bit about the digital divide and growth and wealth. It's not very easy, actually, to determine what drives wealth. Uh, I'm an economist, fundamentally, or actually I'm a social psychologist, fundamentally, but I study economics. Um, and I've worked a lot in developing countries, microfinance, for example, which was seen as a panacea, in a way, for, for creating growth, and particularly seen as a panacea for creating microenterprises and, and SME growth, which it didn't turn out entirely to be. But it turned out to be very useful to, for empowering people to have more control over their uh, private finance and their, their, their well-being. Uh, it did some very good uh, changes in gender equality, uh, and it continues to thrive on its own without development aid, pretty much. So it's the biggest thing out there that nobody talks about so much today, because it just exists. And it's been driven very much by digital and finance and financial services uh, and cell phones. Um, 
but it has created wealth because people are able to bridge um, situations in their lives that uh, you can use finance for if you don't have insurance, right? for example. But insurance has come into the picture. So it's a, it's a wealth creation in the sense that you're more in control, you can bridge difficult situations. Now, different di dimensions of SME finance have come to the picture that look at what reality really says about us, that very few of us are actually entrepreneurs. If you go to a bank in France and you look at the situation in Kenya, the number of people who are actually entrepreneurs is quite, quite similar, the share of the clients of the bank. So why would we think microfinance could suddenly do a magic trick? when it takes much more than that. Um, but wealth is also created, we know, um, by populating the local market better, by using the market more effectively. Second Avenue in New York is one of the most efficient marketplaces. If you walk up and down, which I did for 10 years, you very quickly see where there's no cafe here. There's no 7-Eleven. I've walked five, six blocks. Why is there no 7-Eleven? Or well, nothing like it. And of course, a couple of weeks later, there is one, right? It's, it's, it's very easy. Right? To, to see what's needed. So that market is very efficient. The needs are met and, and, and you know, it's obvious for everybody to see. So very quickly it happens. That's something that we're trying in the development community to replicate in a way in developing countries. The local economic dimension, getting money out of the mattresses if you like, or creating value through more effective local economies. Now if AI can help in that, which I think it actually can, I think there is a lot of opportunities for artificial intelligence, and we don't have to go into all the technologies about that. We've talked a lot today already. But I think there are functions of AI that can help to understand better the needs, the demands, the supply dimensions, and so on, of markets that can make them more effective. So there, I think, there's big opportunity for developing countries to catch up. Um, um, what we do know for sure, and this is something that's fascinating, because we look at the future, and we talk about technology uh, and how it's changing everything. Yet, when we predict, for example, how long we will have to work to make the pension system you know, add up, we typically say, well, it has to be another 10 years. So we now it's 65, we have to work until 75. It just doesn't add up, right? And you can see how what mistakes we're making. We're projecting historical data to the future without thinking about the technical, technological shifts or the, the big paradigm shifts in behavior and technology that we none of us usually saw coming, right? None, nobody saw Elon come, nobody saw Google come, even though we used it, most of us, and so this is much better than Yahoo, but we didn't draw any conclusions that this thing would grow out of proportion, right? So uh, these technology shifts will come, and what's good, as Moes said, and, and also uh, you said, is that we are much better prepared this time around to, to potentially, anyway, much better prepared than when the internet came around. Right? So maybe this technology shift will be a little more inf informed, right? maybe. Uh, I, I'm a little doubting in that sense, because I think the applications, like you said, are not going to come from the big players, necessarily. We have a perception that it's all going to be Google and Facebook and so on, right? I think you're exactly right. This will pop up out of the blue, right? And the innovation uh, society we need, people who can think out of the box, the moon shoots, you know, we have a price, price, uh, price here in, in the audience. Um, that capacity is, is what drives these things and the ability to test it. But then from our point of view at UNESCO, we really want to say for what purpose, right? Well, it, the purpose needs to be good. But otherwise, we, if it's just economic gain, gain, we're in trouble, right? Um, so I'm jumping a little bit, but what's really surprising about this pension prediction is that uh, we don't take these, um, these paradigm shifts into account when we do predictions. So um, I think it will be exactly the opposite. I think we will see technology that will change our um, pension ages. I think we will work less. Um, I'm maybe less uh, optimistic on the job market, but I think who wants to work in jobs five days a week that we don't like, right? You can put it from that perspective as well. But then, of course, what do you f do with your time, right? So, so I think the co-leapfrogging comes into that picture. Um, um, but uh, so, so if it's true that paradigm shifts create wealth creation or that what I mean by that is that we have productivity growth, right? The productivity jumps and the world gets richer. Not everybody, but on average, everybody gets richer. We've seen that throughout history. So if AI has that capacity, everybody gets richer. What you cannot avoid then is a discussion about distribution of wealth. 
distribution of wealth. So let me come then to, to AI as a driver of technology and low-cost, high-quality social services. If the world gets richer because costs come down, we're more productive for the same service, right? Of course, services also become more efficient and higher quality. A future where we in Europe live ever longer lives, maybe um, we enhance our bodies by CRISPR technologies that we use in ourselves, if we can't control it. Uh, and the rest of the world, or at least in our case, our neighbors south of the uh, Mediterranean, continue to live in suffering that's made severe by climate change. It's not a scenario that we can afford. It's not a scenario that I believe will happen, because I don't think Europe will survive if that happens. Not that they will invade us, but, but there will be political um, um, con consequences. We've already seen them. We will go in a downward spiral of populism, inward oriented. Um, so what came out of the Futures Literacy Seminar in Norway, which is fascinating, was that Norway's future is very interlinked with the future of our neighbors in south of the Mediterranean and others living in less fortunate societies for, for a number of reasons. So my prediction is that Europe and other rich regions will actually step up as prices for energy go down through artificial intelligence and other technologies, as social services become cheaper and more widely available, less people, um, 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 uh, less, less expert uh, required. If you look at the numbers in, in Africa today, they don't add up. You will have two to three billion people in 2050 and maybe four in the end of the century. Even those numbers are quite insecure, but certainly you will have another billion, probably one and a half. So if you look at the numbers of additional classrooms, clinics, doctors, teachers, job opportunities, nothing adds up right now. It's completely in the opposite direction. We will not let that happen, I think, because we just can't afford it and we don't want it. So I'm hopeful and my prediction would be that through AI technology and related, and I think it's wrong to talk about AI as general as we do, I think we need to go into very specific usage of AI. I think AI will be a big driver for CRISPR, for example because of big data um, analysis and so on. So I think we will help our um, fellow human beings who still live under $5 a day, about two thirds of the world, uh, to come up into a situation where maybe it's not manufacturing driven growth and wealth, because I do see uh, that the model we've seen in China is not necessarily going to come to Africa, for example, of manufacturing driven growth. Um, so it may be very, very well AI-driven changes, not necessarily jobs, but, but changes of our lives, lifestyles, right? So at UNESCO, we're looking very closely at what that could mean. We're working with young people all over the world to talk about the future of lifestyles and what we actually mean by well-being. So I'm going to get to, get to the well-being part. Um, the um, well-being matters because it, it determines if you understand well-being and if you focus on it as a measure of a country's performance rather than just GDP, which is happening right now as we speak. Wales just introduced well-being into their budgeting process as the first country. As a requirement, you need to be able to explain how any investment will help well-being, intergenerational well-being too, on basis of social environment uh, and economic factors, and perceived well-being being the, the highest level indicator. If you can't have answers, if you can't provide answers on those indicators, your investment will not go through. And they just took the biggest infrastructure investment they've planned for, for decades out of the picture, which was a freeway to Cardiff. No longer on the table because of the well-being index. So this is real. Um, so if you talk about that and you engage people on well-being, I think the community around how to use AI for the good and other technologies has a chance to change. I think it links back to Hans Jonas's prediction. We need to understand if we need to have 100% certainty if something is good or not, or if it's certain scientifically or not, to take a decision, or whether we can use some of the science and some of our humane uh, and human dimensions that we understand better if governments, for example, focus on well-being rather than just economic growth. The discussion will change. So I think the AI systems of the future need to be taken into that picture of well-being, where people will have a chance to really reflect on their own well-being and what it takes, which is not just 
um, in terms of economic and material well-being. We know that very well from the Nordics where I come from. We've done material well-being for a long time. And still people aren't entirely happy, right? It's not no news. So we understand, we have to understand better what it takes. And maybe within that discussion, and this is, again, I have no, no answers on this, but within that discussion, we change the paradigm. We will co-leapfrog with, with our uh, friends who live in less fortunate situations, make 5G, AI applications, health systems that are high quality, but don't require as many trained doctors, can be provided locally, um, services like digitized, digitized education, um, personalized healthcare, and so on. All of these things we talk about, but we will make them available for the poor. Does that change the future of jobs? I think that's the wrong question, actually. I think we have to be prepared for a future without necessarily jobs five days a week. It's my, my belief. And I don't think that's a bad thing, actually. Because if we change our mindsets uh, in a kind of, and this is going to sound really weird, in a Star Trek kind of way, because I talked to some students at my, my son's school the other day. Uh, I was invited as the speaker and I am here um, for, the, for the 10th grade. And I spoke about why there is no money in Star Trek. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because society has leapfrogged into a state where services, access to material dimensions uh, are, are, are provided by the community. Machines produce machines, so who owns them, right? Uh, 3D printing is everywhere. So, you know, how can you have a 1% society will never be accepted? But that's one thing we know historically, it will never be accepted by the communities. Gilets jaunes are here, we have in Chile uprisings. So I think we will see big changes. We will not achieve a Star Trek society where, where the focus is on this, on this, and how we manage our desires, our cave, a human being biology in this new setting where all the services and the knowledge is available and how do we become grand and 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 balanced human beings where intuition is still there right that's kind of what what's going on versus logic that whole game and money is not that's not even an issue because you know these things are produced by machines and machines produce machines and you know we did we designed them that all sounds really crazy but if you look at our mindsets today i really am here is that we can't have a mindset where we think about economic growth and corporate success from that perspective only. And it has to change and it will. So I think the ethics of science, the ethics of business, and our well-being will come together and we will shape a new way of existing that probably will be much better than today for all of us. Co-leapfrogging, co rich and poor together into a new setting. That's my message. Thanks. <laughs>